Hello there ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Williams here again. And in this video lesson, we're going to cover complex patterns of inheritance or other inheritance patterns. We've got a lot of information that we're going to cover in this bad boy, so we're going to go at a pretty good speed. That's the great thing about it being a video though. If you need to pause and rewind or go back and watch it again, you're more than welcome to. So you can always get the information down. The video topics that we're going to look at today deal with Mendel's Laws, three of them, Dominance, Segregation, and the Law of Independent Assortment. Then we're going to break down seven, that's right, seven different types of complex patterns of inheritance. We're going to look at linked genes, intermediate inheritance, otherwise known as incomplete dominance, codominance, sex-linked traits, epistasis, multiple alleles, and we'll finish with polygenic traits. Okay? Without further ado, let's jump right in. Gregor Mendel our scientist monk with the pea plant obsession is the individual that's credited with a lot of basic foundational concepts here for genetics and our general study of inheritance. Three laws credited to Gregor Mendel and all of his findings from years and years ago. The first one being the law of dominance. Pretty much saying that if you've got two alleles for a certain trait, one of them is going to be dominant over the other. The one that is going to be expressed or that you are going to see inside of that organism or the one that is apparent is the dominant allele, whereas the one that is not apparent has no noticeable effect on the organism's appearance is the recessive allele. The second law that we credit Mendel for is the law of segregation or the law of separation. That's when we have two alleles for a heritable her 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 character separating or segregating from one another during gamete formation and ending up in different gametes. Okay, so two alleles for one inheritable trait are not going to go to one gamete. They're going to be broken apart and you'll have one allele for that trait in one gamete and the other allele for that trait in the other gamete. Finally, the law of independent assortment deals with how there are no clicks, there is no peer pressure during the movement, alignment, and separation of these alleles on the chromosomes. Okay, each pair of alleles separate independently from other pairs of alleles during gamete formation. So you cannot have alleles for different traits kind of teaming up and moving with one another to these different gametes. There's, there's no rhyme, there's for no reason. It's complete independent assortment. But quick disclaimer, we'll see here in a second, that there is a little bit of an exception to this. Okay, so a little bit of a visual here for segregation. We can see in meiosis one that the homologous chromosomes separate from one another, and that's when we get the actual allele segregation. See towards the top of our diagram that we've got a dominant allele, the big Y, and a lowercase y representing the recessive allele. All right, you can see that through meiosis one that those two are going to move away from one another, and what results in prophase two is we've got the dominant alleles in the cell to the right and the recessive alleles into the, in the cell to the left. Segregation, separation of alleles that encode for an inheritable trait. Now, for a visual here on the law of independent assortment, we can see that in prophase one, we've got the forming of chromosomes and those homologous chromosomes are matching up with other homologous chromosomes, creating homologous pairs. Now, in metaphase one, we have the lining up of these homologous pairs on the equator or the midplate of the cell. And we can see that in the left of our diagram, we've got the two blue homologous chromosomes on the same side of the equator and the two red homologous chromosomes on the same side. But that doesn't always have to be the case. These guys line up randomly and independent of one another. And we can see that in the cell to the right during metaphase one, when the blue homologous chromosome at the top is to the left and the blue homologous chromosome on the bottom is to the right. And we can see throughout the rest of of the meiotic process, just the variation that is created through this independent assortment step. Now, we said a couple of minutes ago that there was a disclaimer or an exception to the law of independent assortment, and it's the linked genes. So every now and then, we've got genes located on the same chromosome, and they tend, tend to be inherited together. Uh, so such genes are known as linked genes, and when you've got genes that are linked with one another, located roughly in the same area of a chromosome, they do not assort independently. Okay, in our diagram over here to the right, we can see that the genes for A and the genes for C are found right next to each other on these two chromosomes, these two homologous chromosomes. So they're, they're actually going to 
assort themselves in a non-independent fashion. Linked genes are one exception to the law of independent assortment. Okay, we're going to wipe our hands clean with the Gregor Mendel information there as we use those three laws to kind of really give us a good foundation and understanding of traits being passed on from parent to offspring. But, but we've got seven complex patterns of inheritance that we need to look into with a little more detail. And the first one being intermediate inheritance or incomplete dominance. The heterozygote has a phenotype that is kind of in between the phenotypes of the two homozygotes. So for instance here with our petal colors for our flowers, we've got a red flower and a white flower and our parent generation in the first filial generation ends up being pink. The color that's on display, that's a parent, the phenotype is pink. That would be incomplete dominance where neither the white homozygous parent or the red homozygous parent are being fully expressed in the heterozygous offspring. What happens when we cross that heterozygous offspring with another heterozygous individual? Well, then we get ourselves a Punnett square that has a 25% chance of an offspring being red, 50% chance of pink showing itself again, and a 25% chance of white being the color that the offspring will display. Next up, Codominance, or when we see the heterozygote expressing both traits at the same time. And our example here is going to be with some roan cattle, or the roan color present in cattle. All right? Three types of colors here on display amongst these cattle red, roan, and white. Now, when we cross two red cattle, okay, we're going to go ahead and have a 100% chance that the offspring's going to be. Red in color. That's what our Punnett square would tell us. And I like how these two in the picture are facing off against each other. Very intense. Now, if we have two white cattle crossing, 100% chance that the offspring will be, drum roll please, white. White in color. Okay? However, when we have two roan cattle cross with one another, and they have that heterozygous genotype, we've got a couple different possibilities here, okay? There's a 25% chance that the offspring could be red. There's a 50% chance that the offspring could remain roan in color like the parents, or a 25% chance that the offspring could be white, okay? And again, the roan color is both red and white being shown at the same time, okay? The heterozygote expresses both traits that are encoded on that gene. If we were to cross a red... With a roan, we're going to have a 50% chance of a red offspring and a 50% chance of a roan colored offspring. And if we were to cross a homozygous red with a homozygous white, 100% chance of roan color. Okay? 100% chance that the offspring is going to display both red and both white. Our last combination here would be a roan cattle crossing with a white colored cattle, and we would get similar to the red with the roan, we'd get a 50% chance of roan and that offspring, or a 50% chance of that offspring being white in color. Codominance, the heterozygote expressing both traits at the same time. Our next complex pattern of inheritance deals with genes that are encoded on the sex chromosomes, so that 23rd pair. Okay, if you remember, the genotype for a male is XY and the genotype for a female is XX. So all of these genes, that we are going to examine here are located on the X or the Y. Now, most of the time, we're talking about recessive traits that are encoded on the X chromosomes. So females typically have two alleles for these genes, whereas a male, because he only has one X chromosome, only has one allele for this trait. Uh, now, if a male inherits a sex-linked recessive allele from his mother, guess what? He's going to express that recessive trait because he doesn't have a chance to get a dominant allele on another X. He's XY, so he's only got one shot here, only one allele. A common sex-linked recessive disorder is red-green colorblindness, okay? Whereas if you're looking at a stoplight, you would not see red, yellow, or green. You'd see many shades of yellow, okay? And if you were looking at leaves in the fall, you wouldn't see green, yellow, or red. You'd see many shades of, you guessed it, yellow, all right? 
Now we got our pedigree to the right here and we can see that we have an unaffected male on the first generation here at the very top. We'll get into pedigrees in a couple of class periods. Um, but he has the big B. Again, this is recessive. So he's expressing normal vision. Whereas the mom on the other's hand is heterozygous for the trace. So she's got the dominant allele and the recessive allele. Well, you know mom's going to be passing an X on to the boy child if they do have a boy. So the one son here over to the far left, the square that's shaded in with blue, is colorblind because mom, 50-50 chance, gave that recessive allele to her son. The dad gave the Y, so we've got a child that is red-green colorblind. And that's not always easy in this world. Grew up with a kid in high school. We travel up to Beatrice, Nebraska, and for some reason, the state of Nebraska decides to allow some towns to put stoplights in a horizontal fashion. So, it was entertaining from time to time, driving through Beatrice, having to tell this individual exactly what the color was on that light. It wasn't your standard red at top, yellow in the middle, green at the bottom. It was horizontally aligned, which threw him for a loop. It was very, very funny. But thinking back to it, we're probably lucky we never had an accident. Next up, epistasis which is when one gene overrides or masks the phenotype of a second gene. But an important note here is that it's not dominance. Okay, it's not dominance because if you were to look at the definition of dominance, that's when one allele masks the expression of another allele for the same gene. Okay, epistasis is when one gene, okay, one opposite trait altogether masks the expression of a different trait altogether. Okay, so when one gene overrides the expression of a different gene for a different trait. Okay, look back through that definition and make sure you are 100% certain with the difference between epistasis and dominance. Our example of epistasis is going to deal with the coat color of dogs. You can see in our diagram here that we have three coat colors, black, yellow, and brown. And this is found in Labrador Retrievers. Now, what you don't know, though, is you probably are not familiar with the fact that the coat color in Labrador Retrievers is controlled by two, two different genes here. One of the genes is going to influence the melanin production, where big B encodes for black and little b encodes for brown. So black is dominant to brown. And another gene encodes for the melanin deposition, or its coverage throughout the coat, uh, where capital E is full deposition, full deposition being dominant, and lowercase e is reduced deposition, or reduced coverage, and it is recessive in this example. Now, if we were to go ahead and cross these traits with one another, cross these alleles, we do it in a dihybrid fashion, all right? We actually use a dihybrid cross, okay? Um, we can get several different products here, because again, there's three coat colors, all righty? Uh, the color is determined by the genotype of the bees. So if there's a big bee present, that coat is going to be black, unless, unless the deposition is reduced. Okay, unless the deposition is reduced. Because we can see here with our yellow individuals, all right, the big B, big B, little E, little E, and the big B, little B, little E, little E, and our big B, little B, little E, little E, we can see that yellow has resulted, even though black wins out in the color battle, yellow has resulted because the deposition or the coverage of that pigment has been reduced. Okay, we get brown when brown wins out, Okay, we're homozygous recessive for that color, and the deposition is full. So the individual's dominant for deposition, has at least one capital E. We also have the chance of getting yellow when brown wins out again. Homozygous recessive for brown, little b, little b, okay? And uh, we're homozygous recessive for deposition, all right? Where it's reduced, little e, little e. So, it's your classic 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio, so it should be with a dihybrid cross. But because of the way the deposition and the color work together, it's a 9 to 3 to 4, with yellow being that other option present. Okay, two more complex patterns of inheritance. Multiple alleles is when we have many genes, many genes with several alleles, existing in the population. So this can really increase, 
uh, and enhance the number of possible genotypes and phenotypes that we see across the population. One great example of multiple alleles is human blood type, and it's determined by three different alleles, an A, a B, and an O, where A and B are actually co-dominant with one another. So notice how we have the capital A and a capital B in the superscripts here for the capital letter I, and O is recessive. So the lowercase i represents the O blood type. Okay, last but not least, polygenic inheritance, where we have many genes, many genes influencing one single trait. This example here in the diagram being eye color. We also see this with skin color and hair color, hence why we have so many variations, because the information is found on many genes, not just one, not just two, tons of genes. So, with a polygenic trait, we see continuous variation amongst the population. Most traits show a range of variation rather than this or that, okay? Um, when multiple genes and environmental factors uh, mingle with each other, it also influences the trait's expression, all right? So there could be some external factors that might be affecting the actual expression of the trait because, again, it's controlled on many genes, so the chances of those changes occurring are much greater. And finally, continuous variation is often described as a frequency distribution. All right, so something maybe like a bell curve, okay, where the range of values for the trait can be either very low or very high. All right, you might have heard a bell curve uh, reference before when talking about uh, scores on an exam at the college level maybe. Um, but uh, kind of like the intermediate or what's found in the example, not the polar opposites, is where you find the majority of the population, but again, you've got a smaller amount on each side, okay? On each side. Our example here to diagram continuous variation amongst a population that uh, is exhibiting a trait that stems from the inheritance pattern that is polygenic is skin color, okay? Skin tone. All right, you could have very light individual crossed with a very dark individual, and the first filial generation would be a heterozygous individual, okay? So kind of like right in the middle here for skin pigmentation. Uh, over here to the right, actual bell curve here, skin pigmentation being very, very light on the left and very, very dark on the right, okay? And you can see the abundance of individuals that would fall into center, all right? Kind of the in-between expression, or heterozygous expression here, okay? After you were to cross the actual genotypes for the first filial generation, since each individual is heterozygous, you can see the numbers, that the majority of individuals would fall somewhere around that heterozygous range, with a fewer amount of individuals following um, on each side of the spectrum, okay? With one side being, again, very light, and the other side being very Okay, that does it for the video. I say that does it, and it was a lot of information. Alrighty, hopefully you got some time to pause, rewind, or rewatch it some other time. Um, and if you have any questions, bug your teacher about it. Thanks for tuning in, and hopefully you got an idea about the many, many ways in which traits can be passed on from parent to offspring. Mr. Williams signing off. See everybody later.